Let's talk DAWs, digital audio workstations if you're new to the topic. These days, there are more options than ever when it comes to finding software for recording and working with audio. I get a lot of questions from folks online and friends who are musicians asking which DAW they should use. The answer is never a simple one though, and really it's going to depend on your specific needs and your comfort level. I've known many folks, myself included, for a long time who used the DAW that they were first exposed to the most. An early mentor of mine had a home studio where I first started really studying audio. Although ADATs were doing the heavy lifting at the time, he was an early adopter of Logic back when it was being developed by eMagic. I was exposed to Logic's way of doing things consistently, from the Apple G3 on through buying my own first Mac, a G4 tower that I paired with Logic Platinum. Then in 2002, Apple acquired eMagic, uh, renamed Logic Platinum to Logic Pro, and in 2003, the G5 tower was introduced and everybody seemed to upgrade to that pretty quick. While I was using Pro Tools, Nuendo, and a handful of other DAWs regularly in other situations, I continued to stick with what I knew and what I was comfortable with on my own systems, all the way until Logic Pro 10 was introduced in July of 2013. My comfort level and speed working in Logic kept me a regular user, even purchasing the full box version for $499 at the Apple Store uh, for a new Mac Mini only weeks before they dropped the price down to $199 and then added it to the App Store for download. Logic did a great job for me over the years, but as it often goes in life, we grew apart over time. Logic Pro 10 offers an incredible tool set for $200. For writing, arranging, recording, producing, and mixing, modern DAWs offer so many tools in one package, but many modern DAWs are just too bloated for my needs. Logic Pro 10, for instance, requires 6 gigabytes just for the minimum install and 63 gigabytes to install the full sound library. My recording work these days typically involves mobile setups, quick one-offs for high-profile or non-repeatable live events. My biggest needs are redundancy and the ability to hand off files quickly in industry standard formats. As an independent freelancer, I need a solution that's affordable and easy to keep up to date as my computers get upgraded or replaced over the years, and also affordable enough to allow me to keep a redundant setup on hand at all times in the event of a failure. Redundancy is everything in live recording for me these days. I've learned hard lessons over the years on live recording jobs, and my approach these days is that it doesn't matter what you're recording live. A politician's speech, a band's live performance, performance, a school play, if you're there to document it, you must be sure that you can capture the whole event. An equipment failure simply can't result in a loss of the recording. Now, in the studio, I tend to trust that a modern recording rig will keep working, barring some sort of catastrophic event. In a mobile recording situation, however, when you're dealing with live events that you just can't get a second take at, things will tend to fail in really unusual and sometimes unrepeatable ways at the worst possible moments. That means I like to carry two computers, two interface solutions, two sets of software. Taking it a step further, even, is using a piece of software that's so lightweight that it can be downloaded quickly to almost any modern computer and run as a reliable and flexible recorder because the software was designed for that purpose from the start. That's how I arrived at Reaper. You start by downloading a 16 megabyte file from reaper.fm. Installation is incredibly simple and pretty quickly you have a full DAW to try out and demo with all of its functionality for free for 60 days. As I worked with it more and saw the flexibility and reliability in the system, I was happy to hand over the $60 for a discount license. The full price of $225 is still a bargain in my opinion, but it's offered at $60 for anybody using it individually, educationally, or commercially even for work grossing less than $20,000 a year in revenue. Updates are handled simply by a pop-up menu that appears occasionally when you launch the program, and that's configurable too. You then have the option to navigate to the same reaper.fm page to download the latest full version. You install it just like you did the first time, and it remembers your license and all your previous settings. Setting up Reaper to work how you want to is both really easy, but so flexible that it might be a little intimidating at first. As far as the layout goes, you can reposition, dock, or float windows any way you like, uh, making custom layouts for various setups, like I use a laptop only for mobile work, but I have an external monitor at home for editing and mixing. You can resize, move, and otherwise customize the layout and lock items in place where you want them, and then make a template that you can recall easily. As for appearance, this is where it really starts to get fun. Themes can be changed simply by navigating over to the theme menu and selecting any installed theme. The basic down
download comes with default and classic themes. But if those don't suit your style, you can head back over to reaper.fm, navigate to resources, and then to themes, where you can look through a whole bunch of other custom themes that have been developed by other users, and you can download them for free. Sometimes there's a donation link. Installing a new theme is as simple as downloading the theme. On a Mac, you're going to need a utility to unarchive some of the .rar files. I'd recommend using the unarchiver as it's free. Once you've extracted the files, you just move them over to the color themes folder within Reaper's resource folder, and you're all set. This is one of my personal favorite themes. It's called Analog API, and it's styled to look like an API console. Setting up a new project is simple and intuitive. Again, there are a lot of options here, so you'll want to be sure to take your time and make sure you're selecting the parameters you need the first few times. Selecting an external hard drive to store files is really easy, and there's a secondary option there as well. Adding tracks is as easy as pressing Command T to get an individual track, or you can right click in the track window and add multiple tracks at once. Once I've done this, I prefer to route my inputs and outputs using the routing matrix, but it can be done at the channel level very easily, and once you have a setup that works for your specific configurations, you can save a template to recall in the future. Naming your tracks before you start recording will ensure that the media files you create during your session are logically labeled, so you can quickly copy them to another drive and hand them off to the next engineer. I could go on for a long time about the various features in Reaper. It comes with a 466 page user guide that you can download for free again at Reaper FM, and that'll answer any specific functionality questions you may have. There's also a very active forum over on Reaper FM's site that's a great place to see what other people are doing with the software, and the Reaper sub on Reddit is also really active with users from all sorts of different backgrounds doing different stuff with the software. I use it because it's lightweight, it's flexible, it's powerful, and it's been really reliable, and it's at a price that I can afford. As somebody who primarily works in live sound and live event production, Reaper ticks a lot of boxes for me, and I thought it was worth sharing with you as well. That's all for this time. As always, I'll provide more links and info about everything in this video in the description below and on the website at dcsoundop.com. See you next time.